All right, so uh, I wanted to give an introduction to the um, HPA axis or hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Um, so generally the, the core of the HPA axis involves um, the hypothalamus, um, the pituitary, and the adrenal glands. In particular, um, uh, something called the adrenal um, cortex, which is the outer part of the adrenal glands. Um, the inside of the adrenal glands, deep inside the adrenal glands, is an area called the adrenal medulla, is where epinephrine, um, also known as adrenaline, gets released by the sympathetic nervous system. This is similar because it's a stress-related pathway, but this is going to release cortisol, and it comes from the word cortex, uh, this is going to release cortisol, um, and, uh, and this is a slower acting but longer lasting stress response pathway. Um, no, the adrenal cortex, confusingly enough, is not part of the brain. We've talked about the cerebral cortex, which is the outer covering of the brain. Um, this is the outer covering of the adrenal glands. Um, so it is um, uh, an outer covering, but of a totally different organ, not the head, the, the little glands that sit on top of it. So, when you have stress signals, that does a number of things, but one thing in particular that stress activates is the amygdala. And then the amygdala has glutamate projections, so that's going to be an excitatory projection into the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then releases something called corticotrophin releasing factor, CRF. We actually saw that once before in the, um, uh, in the addiction lecture, and we're going to talk about that in class. But the CRF is released, and then it binds to CRF receptors on the pituitary, um, which is then going to turn on the pituitary glands. And then the pituitary glands release on something called ACTH, adrenal cortical, so adrenal cortical trophic hormone. So this is a hormone, this actually goes all through the blood, but the only cells in your body that sense this hormone and respond to it are cells in the adrenal cortex. So ACTH goes everywhere in your blood, but it doesn't do anything except when it gets to the adrenal glands, and there, what it does is it causes the release of cortisol. Um, cortisol is like um, cortisol cream that you can use to turn off your immune system. And cortisol does um, a whole bunch of things in your body. One thing is it turns down the immune system. So this is a stress response. And so um, when you're dealing with a lion um, that you've been running away from for 10 minutes, um, you don't want to worry about fighting off cold until you've gotten away from the lion. So this turns down the immune system. Um, it turns up. Um, muscle activity, so to help you to sort of prepare, um, prepare to move. Um, and then also, actually, it travels to the brain where it leads to feeling stressed. Um, it turns out that one of the consequences of cortisol in the brain is that it binds to the amygdala and turns up and excites the amygdala. The amygdala has cortisol receptors, or glucocorticoid, because everything has two names, glucocorticoid. Um, and so glucocorticoid receptors in the amygdala will turn it up, then the amygdala releases more glutamate, um, which then excites the hypothalamus, more CRF, more CACTH, more cortisol, more stress, more, and so that by itself is referred to as a positive feedback system. Um, positive feedback systems are really potentially dangerous. Um, what a positive feedback system does is it means that the more cortisol you get, the more amygdala you get, so more CRF, so more ACTH, so more cortisol, more cortisol, more cortisol, more cortisol, and it can run out of control. So fortunately, there's regulation. Um, one of the other things that cortisol does is it binds to the hypothalamus itself, 
and actually inhibits the hypothalamus. So that is called negative feedback. So in negative feedback, what that means is when cortisol gets released, it will turn down its own production to return back to a lower level. This is a much more common thing you see in biological systems because we don't want something to get out of control. Also, um, I'll move it over here because the drawing's getting a little crowded. Also, cortisol binds to the hippocampus. It actually will activate some cells in the hippocampus, and then those cells in the hippocampus will inhibit as well the um, PVN, um, the particular part of the hypothalamus that's releasing CRM. So there's one positive feedback path and two negative feedback pathways. If the stress from outside, so this is like stress from outside, if the stress from outside continues, then that will keep the cortisol going. If not, because there's more negative feedback than positive feedback, usually the negative feedback wins, and so when cortisol levels go up, they naturally go back down. But if somebody has an overactive amygdala or an underactive hippocampus, then that can mean that the positive feedback is stronger than it normally would be, and the negative feedback is weaker than it normally would be. And so in that case, if the positive feedback is too strong, or if the negative feedback is too weak, or if there's some combination of those two things, then what you will have happen is that um, stress will stress levels will remain high, even when they should return back down. Cortisol levels remain high because some of this shutoff pathway isn't really working. Um, we're going to talk about this in particular in the context of major depressive disorder on Tuesday.